help me in welcoming Anthony and his talk, I Just Didn't Give Up. Thank you very much for that introduction. How's everybody doing today? Honestly, I was saying you guys were kind of quiet out there earlier. I didn't think you guys had much energy left, but it's great to know that you're still awake and you're live in my presentation. It's an absolute honor to be here, so thank you very much for, uh, for having me out. And a huge kudos to you guys, too. I heard some of you traveled quite a ways today to be here on a Saturday, so that's a, a huge shout out to you guys. I don't have too much time, so I'm going to get going right away here, you know? So, growing up, as as far back as I can remember, I knew that I was going to be a professional athlete. It didn't matter what sport that I played, I excelled. One of my first major decisions growing up was, am I going to go to Pine Ridge with all my friends, or am I going to go to Pickering High School, which had a way better sports program, one of the best sports programs in the nation, and pursue my dreams of being a professional athlete? When I got a letter in the mail from Pickering High School outlining all the things that their athletes had done in the schools that they went to, it was a no-brainer for me. I was going to Pickering High School. As a grade nine athlete, I flourished. I was running, oh, we're going forward here. I was running track for high school. I was also, oh, we went way too far forward here. I was warned about this, there we go. So I was running track for the high school. I was playing baseball for Pickering High School as well as volleyball. And then I was playing baseball for the Pickering Red Sox. That year as a grade nine athlete, I pitched the complete game to win the championships for the Pickering Red Sox. Later on that year, I beat the national champion in my very first hurdle race. So that pretty well made me the best hurdler in all of Canada. At that point in time, I knew that I was destined for greatness. Just a year later, I was crowned the OFSA champion. You know, OFSA was mentioned in my, uh, in my bio. If you guys aren't familiar with OFSA, that's where the best in the country or Ontario get together, duke it out, and whoever wins is generally the best in the country. So I was crowned the awesome champion in grade 10, and to put it into perspective for you guys, Donovan Bailey, one of Canada's most decorated athletes, never ever won an offseason gold medal. So that just cemented the fact that I was destined for greatness, and I was going to be a professional athlete. The kicker about that race was that I was injured. So I took the grade 11 year off, and I said, I'm just going to work on my schoolwork, heal my body, and just make sure everything's in line for grade 12 so I can graduate and get that scholarship. Grade 11 was actually the first year of my life that I had free time though. So I found myself in places that I probably shouldn't have been in, especially when class was going on. So grade 12 came along, I started running again. I was in, I like to say, the best shape of my life, but those bad habits persisted. I watched all my friends graduate, take off without me. Grade 13, my victory lap, those bad habits again persisted. And ultimately when it came time for me to accept my athletic scholarship, I couldn't because I didn't have enough credits to graduate. And that's when I like to say the downturn started. It was a, one of the worst times of my life. You know, my relationship suffered, my decision making became extremely poor, and I was a high school dropout, not able to find meaningful work anywhere. But fortunately, I would never want to give up. My mom was always harping on me, I started listening to her. She saw me starting to mature, I got my diploma, and she brought me out to a conference one day where I saw a motivational speaker say that if you found a job that you loved, it wasn't like working a day in your life. So I went to the YMCA, helped them to get me, or they helped me rebuild my resume, and that's when I found Auto Boys Service Center in Pickering. I decided that I wanted to be a mechanic because, again, I loved cars. I was always breaking my mom's, and I figured if I could figure out how to fix it, you know, I wouldn't have to pay too much money. So, it was like a dream job, guys. Honestly, when I walked in the doors every morning, I got to work with cars that most men and women only dreamed about. Uh, I wish I had a couple pictures here, but I just, for the sake of time, I took some of them out. Uh, within a few months, I was doing brake jobs, ripping apart engines, beginning to weld. I started going to school for the, uh, the theory part, because the practical was in the shop. Two nights a week, I was attending Centennial College. Life was going absolutely amazing. I was learning, I was happy, and uh, started training on my own until September 30th, that fateful day, 2009. It was the very last day that I walked out of my house. It was a regular day at the shop. I was in there, my boss was there kind of early which was a little weird, and I said, uh, hey, what's up, how's it going? He said, we have some scrap cars to bring down the street after lunch. I said, doesn't matter to me, I have my jobs to do. So I was doing four wheel alignments all morning long. Now, if I was working at Ford or Chevy or something like that, 
I would have been sweeping the floors, but at Auto Boys, I was being able to just get thrown into the fire, essentially. It was a great day, the coffee truck showed up, blew the horse, signaling that it was time for lunch, and after I devoured a couple of lunches, I was sitting in front of my toolbox, just texting, and somebody came over to me and said, can you help us bring these cars down the street to the scrapyard? And I'm kind of like, hummed and I hot. I was like, I'm on my lunch, guys, but I'm a nice guy, and I'll help you out. Took my cell phone, threw it on top of my toolbox, started proceeding over to these cars. And that's when I got that first gut instinct feeling letting me know that something wasn't right. And I said to them, how are we getting these cars down the road? And they said, we're gonna bump them down the road. And I was like, okay. Now we had bumped cars around the lot that were not working if the battery had died or something like that and we used one vehicle to push another vehicle. But I'd never done this on the public road before. So then I was like, whatever, I trusted my boss, I figured everything would be okay. Started walking over to the car again, and that's when I got that second gut instinct feeling letting me know that something wasn't right. And I said to them, how are we supposed to get these cars down the road if you guys drain all the fluids out? Now all the fluids had been drained out, including engine oil, gas, brake fluid, power steering, because when you crush a car at the scrapyard, you don't want all that stuff going everywhere and creating environmental hazard. So I said to them, how am I supposed to stop the car if there's no brake fluid in the lines? They reassured me that there was enough fluid in the lines, and when I jumped into that pass or the driver's seat, stepped on that brake pedal, it went all the way to the floor. And to this day, it's one of the eeriest feelings I've ever felt in my life. That's when I like to say the choo-choo train started. My boss pushed my buddy out into the road first, pushed me out to the road second, and that's when it all started. He hit me from behind, I hit my buddy, he hit me again, until we were going down the road about 50 kilometers an hour, two hands on the steering wheel, and the key in the ignition so that it didn't lock up. Luckily, there was no cars on the road because we both went wide around that bend, and as we got to the driveway of the scrapyard, my buddy's right front wheel falls off and he slides into the curb. I'm just shaking my head like, this is absolutely nuts. And after a failed attempt of trying to get me onto the weigh-in scale, a bobcat operator was called over and he pushed me up onto the scale where I close to a stop. That's when a green light comes on signaling that they got the weight of the vehicle and it's time for me to exit the weigh scale, jump out of the car and head back to the shop. Now, as I'm rolling off this scale, looking to the left-hand side of the scale to get out and go back to the shop. What I didn't know was that this guy was rolling through the yard. And before, well, if he shows, I'm scared to press it too, too hard because I know there he is. <laughs> He's coming through the yard. And before I even had a chance to react out of the corner of my right eye, he drops the massive six foot wide magnet on the car, crushing me inside. He then proceeds to pick me up to about 15 feet in the air, and that's when the Bobcat operator jumps out and says, there's somebody still inside the car. The crane operator panics and drops me from 15 feet, and I come crashing back down to the ground. Instantly, I was jarred awake. My hand still on the steering wheel, and when I looked to the right, the roof was about six inches away from my head. And I was just kind of like, thank God, because I knew exactly what had happened. Ironically, my buddy was the first at the side of the car door, and being the small, weak guy that he is, he couldn't get the door open. My boss came, pretty well went hulking, almost ripped the door right off of his hinges. So my buddy knelt down beside me, he says, dude, can you feel everything? I can feel the pain in my arms, I can feel the pain in my torso, but when I went to move my legs, nothing happened. Reached out with my right arm, slapped my right leg, fell over to my left leg. Firefighters showed up on scene, put a blue tarp over my face, cut the roof off of the jaws of life. Paramedics showed up, and that's when they let me know that they weren't going to be able to transport me on the ground due to the severity of my injuries, and I was being airlifted to Sunnybrook. Toronto's number one trauma center. I have a couple pictures of the car here. Which friend? Thank you. That's what it is. All right, so on the top left one, you can see the roof pretty well got the magnet took up the whole thing, and just on the way the angle came in and crushed it down, they said when they looked inside the car, it was like I was sitting inside a cocoon. Bottom left here is the driver's side. When they dropped the car, it came down on the back end. The the seat broke, so I actually ended up in the back seat. You can see that towel was, was the headrest, so they put the towel underneath my head just to hold my neck up. The bottom right is probably the scariest picture for me because I think it's like tinfoil in your kitchen, you know? If that claw had gone through the door where I was sitting, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today speaking to you guys. And then again, the last claw went right through the middle of the dashboard, bring the, breaking it, and uh, the dashboard was actually sitting on my legs. So within the hour, my mom and my sister were sitting in the emergency room beside my bed, and I'm strapped down with uh, the straps on the backboard, the neck brace, and all I really remember is the doctor walking in and saying, your son will never walk again. 
At that very moment, everything just went black. Knowing that my legs were my everything, that I'll never be able to use them again, sent me into a state of shock. I started projectile puking straight up into the air. The nurse came over, started clearing it out of my eyes, took a tube, shoved it up my nose, down my throat, into my stomach so I wouldn't choke and die. And after that, I don't really remember anything. The next morning, I went for surgery. I found that I broke my back around the T9 vertebrae, right around my belly button. That, and that's where I damaged my spinal cord, rendering me a complete paraplegic. So I have no use or movement from the waist down. I also have two rods and eight screws, or nine, I'm not really sure, but they're still in there. And you can see that right there on the, uh, I guess it would be the right hand side of the screen for you guys. I had broken or crushed all of my ribs. I had a minor fracture at C6 at the bottom of my neck. And if I damaged my spinal cord there, the dexterity and strength that I value so much today would be a lot different. So going forward, I spent one week in the Sunnybrook's ICU, their intensive care unit, and another month on the trauma ward, on the trauma ward there at Sunnybrook. After that, I was getting shipped out to rehab. And I remember just being in the car and realizing exactly what had happened with my hands still on the steering wheel. And I looked to the roof and I just said, thank God, because I realized how close to death I was. And when I got wheeled to rehab, I uttered those words again because it became apparent to me just how lucky I was coming out of this accident, having all the injuries that I had sustained. I was in there and I saw people that couldn't move anything or collarbone down. And that was just from falling down a couple of stairs. You know, the mere fact that I was eventually able to transfer from my bed to my wheelchair on my own was a blessing, guys. Never mind the little things like being able to scratch my nose or open a water bottle. So that was three months of rehab. With physiotherapy and occupational therapy, thank God, I progressed quickly, got strong, became confident with my new wheels. I was ready to spread my wings. So I left rehab, and me being me, wanting to get back to life as if I hadn't missed a beat, I started speaking to youth pretty well immediately, right out of the gate, because I wanted to let you guys know that life is fragile. When you're out there having fun with your friends and partying, I was a huge partier, and I'd love to just, we won't get into that, but <laughs> a lot of you guys know that life's so fragile, you need to be careful when you're out there. Take that extra 30 seconds when you're about to make decisions that could impact you for the rest of your life. Furthermore, I want you to know that you can say no to unsafe work and to listen to that gut instinct when it comes, because it will, and it won't steer you wrong. I started to drive, got a girlfriend, and pretty well resumed somewhat of a regular life, but there was still a huge void. And that was sports. So I was just like, what am I gonna do? And everyone's like, you need to try wheelchair basketball. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna try this. But when I received a phone call from a wheelchair basketball coach recruiting me and asking me to come play for his basketball team, I quickly realized that this was just like the able-bodied side of sport and that I'd have a second chance at living my dream as a professional athlete, a second chance that many do not get. And you know, guys, over the past 10 years, the lessons that I've learned, they will really carry me through the rest of my life. One of the key phrases that I turn to is, things don't happen to you, they happen for you. And it was when I was able to start seeing the light in every situation that my life really started to turn around for the better. The wheelchair was a new lease on life for me, and sitting at home on the couch, moaning and groaning, would bring me no closer to my dreams, goals, or happiness. You know, getting out there, embracing every new experience, trying every new sport, getting out of my comfort zone, and motivating others to live their best life has not only helped me to heal, but brings me joy. And with that being said, I didn't just try basketball. I tried as much as I could. I tried golf. It's a $26,000 golf machine that the owner of the golf or course bought and uh, allowed people with disabilities to come and just play for free. Tried six skiing. That was absolutely funny. I started snowboarding right before my injury. I thought I'd never make it to the back or the top of the mountain ever again. So six skiing was a ton of fun, and I can't wait to get back there. And a couple other things and recreational activities, including driving a wheelchair tank through the forest. But it was when my buddy lent me his hand cycle that everything changed. I never got to compete as an able-bodied able -bodied cyclist, and I was riding my bike everywhere. And when I found out that the hand cycle was a Paralympic sport, it was like that Olympic flame had been reignited. I decided to take on the ultimate goal of trying to make the Canadian men's national cycling team and representing my country at the Paralympic Games. I started this journey a mere five years ago, right before the Rio 2016 Games. And I didn't make those games. I had no idea what I was doing. I was such a rookie, and I needed to go through the growing pains 
that all these cyclists needed to endure in order to get strong and fast on the bike. So with only four years to go before the Tokyo 2020 Games, the race was on. I spent anywhere from five to 16 hours a week on the bike. I was riding anywhere from 15 to 130 kilometers, averaging speeds between 20 and 40 kilometers an hour. It was absolutely amazing. Sports teams or uh, strength and conditioning, nutrition, physio, pyro, massage are just some of the things that it takes to compete with the best in the world. Now with the recent turn in events over the past couple of months, I went to my first World Cup and I was bumped into the fastest class in the world based on my level of function. With that being said, it doesn't leave me a lot of time to do what I need to do in order to make the Tokyo 2020 team to go to the Paralympics. And again, with that being said, I don't know if I'm gonna go, I'm gonna fight tooth and nail to make sure that I do go. But the question was, was posed to me that they said, what if you don't go? And you know, the optimist, the optimist in me was kind of like, well, then there's Paris 2024, right? And I was just kind of like, but I don't want to look there. And I said to them, I really thought about it. And I said, I've learned so much and I've grown so much over these past few years. If I had to put my goals and dreams out to the atmosphere, many of the opportunities that I've had probably wouldn't have happened. You know, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to speak to the CRA, Transport Canada, many high schools and elementary schools and businesses and conventions and conferences just like this. I've made television appearances on breakfast television, as well as recently making the cover of a magazine. I modeled for Is Adaptive, one of the world's leading accessibility fashion brands, as well as TD Bank, Raz Designs, and many more. I was the accessibility chair for the 2019 Parasport Games, one of the most successful Parasport Games to date. And I was also the ambassador for the People in Motion Show, one of Canada's largest accessibility trade shows. You know, there's still a ton of work to be done in order for me to reach my ultimate goal, but life has never, ever been better. At the end of the day, some would say, if I don't make Tokyo, that I failed at reaching my goal. And again, I don't really look at not making the games as a failure, because failure is a great teacher. You know, it's not always a bad thing. Failure can teach us as much or more than many of our successes. It is necessary and it causes growth. It'll force you to regroup and re-examine your goals and what you need to do in order to get there. You know, it can suck and be painful like not making the national team yet or failing at making your goal, well, I haven't done that yet, but not making your goal of the Paralympic Games for the second time in a row now. You know, guys, there's a process to competing on the world stage and if you don't have the points behind you or the international experience, it's pretty difficult to make a case for yourself to go. But with that being said, Life's not easy and life's not fair. But I want you guys to know that despite what happens, no matter what, at any point in time in your life, you guys can reinvent yourself. It doesn't matter if it's the death of a loved one, loss of a job, breaking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend of how many years, or simply just breaking your back. You know, I want you to know that you have greatness within you and the ability to conquer whatever you put your mind to. I want you guys to remember that things don't happen to you. They happen for you. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you very much.